shirt. It's back to the afternoon. Okay. So we're going to tackle the uh, topic today of can we trust the Bible? The Bible is unarguably an incredible book. It is a best-selling book, most quoted, most popular, uh, most sorry, published, most circulated, most translated book, and the most influential book in mankind. There is no close second when it comes to impact. So why should anybody believe that it's true? I mean, let's, after all, it could be a fraud. It could be written by men. It could be an ancient book of mythology. It could be fanciful or even deceitful writings of other men. What about other books? What about books like the Quran, the Book of Mormon? What makes the Bible so different from those books? These are questions, intelligent questions, that critical people are asking today and should ask today. So we as Christians need to be able to answer their questions. The more people ask questions, the more it shows that they are open. We need to be patient and kind and give them the information that Satan doesn't want them to find. So I'd like to share with you 10 evidences of why I believe we can trust the Bible. Evidence number one, fulfilled prophecy. Fulfilled prophecy is something that sets the Bible aside and apart from every other religious book there is. There are actually 26 other religious books that we know of, major ones, of faith that are supposedly div divinely inspired. Hindu Vedas, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, of these 26 books, not a single one of them contains any specific prophecies. Wow. That is unique to the Bible. Wow. In stark contrast, in actual fact, in the Bible, 27% of the Bible contains what was predictive prophecy at the time that it was written. 27%. And the authors of the Bible did not just predict some vague things like Nostradamus or John Dixon, who had been proven to be fraudulent. They were very specific. Consider a few of the Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You think about it. It said he was to be born of Abraham's seed in Genesis, of the tribe of Judah, of the lineage of David. In Micah 5.2, it said he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would come while the temple was still standing, which was destroyed 40 years after he died. He said it would be born of a virgin, not a prophecy he would necessarily put in there. He said he would open up the eyes of the blind, unstop the ears of the deaf, and cause the lame to walk. A radical prophecy. It foretold precisely when he would come in Daniel 9.24, how he would die in crucifixion that was not in existence when it was prophesied in Isaiah. And that he would rise from the dead in Psalm 1610. These are very specific prophecies. And they're just a few relating to the Messiah. Now the fact that these prophecies and hundreds of others have been fulfilled, even though they were spoken hundreds, even thousands of years before they were fulfilled, is strong evidence that the Bible was not written by man, but an all-knowing God outside time, all-powerful orchestrating life as we know it. No other religious book contains prophecies. The second one, archaeological evidence. You know, archaeological discoveries can never prove the Bible is divinely inspired, but they do help a compelling case for the historical reliability of the Bible. Of course, many people today think that the Bible is a book of mythology, that a person's places and even Events that happen in the Bible were invented by the authors. Well, advanced in archaeology, in science helping us discover these things, in the past 150 years, archaeologists have been verifying the exact truthfulness of its Bible's details, recording various events, customs, practices, even nations that we now know exist. That the, Bible, the only record we have of knowing that they existed were in the Bible. Nelson Gluick, who appeared on the cover of Time magazine and who was considered one of the greatest archaeologists ever, quotes, no archaeological discovery has ever 
controverted or overturned a biblical reference. Not one. Scores of archaeological finds have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible. And by the same token, proper evaluation of biblical descriptions has often led to amazing discoveries. These are written by a man who is credited with uncovering more than 1,500 ancient sites in the Middle East. In actual fact, when archaeologists want to know where something is, they first check the Bible. You know, Donald Wiseman, an archaeologist and professor at Surreal at the University of London, estimated that there are more than 25,000 discoveries that have confirmed the truthfulness of the Bible. What is staggering is, is those facts were from 1958. 1958. That's 60 years ago. You think about some things. I had the privilege with Kerry at Christmas to go to Israel. So some of the things I'm about to talk about, I have seen last week. You know, you say, well, I saw it when I was younger, like last week. Pontius Pilate, who oversaw the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. Nobody believed that Pontius Pilate existed. And yet, um, in June of 1961, a team of Italian archaeologists was digging in Caesarea on the shore of the beautiful Mediterranean Sea, about 55 miles northwest of Jerusalem. While digging in a jumble ruins of a Roman theater, these archaeologists made an amazing discovery. They found a limestone block about three feet tall and two feet wide that had been turned upside down and reused as part of a flight of steps. It bore an inscription in Latin mentioning Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. We also now know that since this discovery in 1961, Pilate's official residence in Caesarea has also been identified. Caiaphas, the high priest that oversaw uh, the the, uh, persecution of Jesus, his tomb has actually been unearthed. In 1990, a team of construction workers building a water park approximately two miles south of Jerusalem accidentally unearthed a first century burial cave that was his. Again, these are things easily found um, on the internet, or if you go to Jerusalem. Amen. <laughs> King David. It was actually thought for a long time that King David was a myth. So definitely growing up, as I was a Christian, I was baptized 28 years ago today. <laughs> so when I was baptized, everybody went, there is no proof of King David. Now for you, that's not true. Because in 1993... Although there was no evidence, then there came evidence. So it collapsed, people's sort of skepticism of King David, although we've got the city of David and Jerusalem and everything, collapsed overnight in 1993 when a nearly 3,000-year-old inscription on black basalt was discovered in the town of Dan, which is like a little uh, just north of uh, Galilee in Israel. The inscription, written in Aramaic by Israel's enemies, described the defeat of the kings of Judah and Israel, mentioning the king of Israel and the king of the house of David. So again, we just see that, you know, science is catching up with what God says. Um, Archaeology does not prove the scriptures are from God. But what it does do is go, you know what, nothing in the Bible we are finding out is wrong. How does that compare There is not one single piece of evidence that has ever been found for the Book of Mormon. No trace of the large cities and names in America that it claims about. No ruins, no coins, no letters, no documents, no monuments. Nothing. That's in stark contrast to when you actually go there. It's actually amazing. So I spent uh, New Year's Eve sort of night praying around Jerusalem. And it is just amazing. You've got literally the city of David that they are uncovering there. And you've got it all there. And you go, how can people not believe it's here? That's literally like saying Caesar and Rome didn't exist. It's here. So you go there and you go, how can we argue with that? Number three, the Bible's internal consistencies. Well, what do I mean by internal consistencies? I'm talking about the Bible's internal harmony. From the first book, Genesis, to the last book, Revelation... The Bible is consistent within itself. We go, well, what evidence is that for divine origin? There are plenty of books that are internally consistent. Well, yes, 
but they were all written by one person. You know, the Bible addresses life's most controversial questions. A history book writes about a battle. Who won? Who lost? What happened? But they're not the type of questions that the authors of the Bible are dealing with. The authors of the Bible deal with things like how the universe came into existence. Does God exist? If so, what is he like? Why does man exist? What is our purpose for being here? Why is there evil and suffering? What happens to us after we die? The whys in life. These are big controversial questions that nobody can agree on. So you would accept, expect people in the Bible to disagree on those because no two philosophers agree today. Aristotle, Plato, Muhammad, they don't agree. And yet these are all consistent. The Bible is a collection of 66 different documents. So why is it easy for the Quran to have harmony? Well, it's just one book. That's it. It's all written by one person. So it's easier. There are 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. It is written by 40 different authors. So again, there's a lot of suggestion there that how can 40 people agree? Um, then there are many, uh, all of those authors come from different educational backgrounds. So have you ever had that thought where, you know, I find it hard to actually connect with somebody that's 16 year old, 17 year old, somebody that's a farmer, somebody who's an architect, because you're not into the same things. Peter was a fisherman, Paul was a scholar, Daniel was a prime minister, Asphalt was a musician, Max, Matthew was a tax collector, David was a shepherd and then a king. Luke was a historian, a medical doctor. You know, we all have biases because of our education and the way we do our jobs, etc. So again, there's a number of reasons why they shouldn't agree. Also, the Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years, some 60 generations. How do our views on life change over two generations, one generation, let alone 60 generations? Many of the authors did not even, or actually most of the authors did not even know each other. Many of the uh, authors were separated by hundreds of miles. Whereas the writers of things like the Quran, they were all very local to one another. The Bible was written in a variety of places, Africa, Asia, Europe. For example, Paul wrote some imprisoned in Rome. The Apostle John was on the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean. The prophet Ezekiel wrote his book while captive in Babylon. Lots of different things to, you know, uh, to, to influence you where a contradiction would come in. The Bible was written in three different languages. Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And I was even discussing with Scotty how different translations, even of the Bible, when you put them into a different language, it doesn't quite, you know, it's not the same. Doesn't, there's not a word in Samoan for this, or there's not a word in Chinese for this. And yet it's complete harmony through those three languages. How is that possible? Well, 2 Peter 1.20 says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in humans, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God was the one writing the Bible. They were simply the instruments like us writing on a piece of paper with a pen. But the author was consistent because it was God. Fourthly, extra Bible writings. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the fact that there are dozens of historical writings outside the Bible. People often go, well, I want proof outside of the Bible. Because obviously the people in the Bible are going, this is true. In records in Assyria, in Babylon, in Roman, these are people that are not pro-Judaism or Christianity. These are the enemies. And what do enemies normally try and do? Lie, distort. You know, when people win a great victory or take over a country and they rewrite history, do they write, you know, the opposition in a good light or in a bad light? They always twist things. Victors always tell lies mixed in with history. You know, you know, uh, you know, Chairman Mao can fly. You know, the North Korea leader, he can fly. I mean, there's a lot of distortion in there because they're the victors. External sources verify that 50 people mentioned in the Old Testament and 30 people in the New Testament are actually historical figures. Um, there's a, uh, there's a uh, note down here to plenty of places you can look that up. I think there are 39 or more sources outside the Bible written within 150 years of Jesus' life that attest 
that more than a hundred facts regarding Jesus' life, teaching, crucifixion, and resurrection, all happened. One of the most famous and most accessible is a Jewish historian called Flavius Josephus. So not a Christian, a Jew, and a Roman favorite in the end. Josephus mentions more than a dozen individuals talked about in the Bible. Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, Caiaphas, Pontius Pilate, John the Baptist, James the brother of Jesus, Felix, Festus, and even Jesus. You can buy a copy of his writings. Josephus wrote, it says, At this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous, and many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified to die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, and that he was alive. So this is a Roman historian that was a Jew. Neither of those people were pro-Christianity going, this is what they believe and this is what they were saying. Okay. There are many other people that quote facts. There's Cornelius Tatticus, a Roman historian. Gaius Senatonius, a chief secretary of Emperor Hadrian, like the ruler of the world at that time. The Jewish Talmud. Yes, the Jewish Talmud. That's the extra writing of the Jews. Other outside writings in the Bible collaborate with the flood, long life uh, spans prior to the flood, details surrounding the Exodus, the Assyrian invasion in the days of Hezekiah, Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of Judah, prolonged darkness on the day Jesus died, the expulsion of the Jews from Rome in AD 49. These are to name just a few. There is a lot of evidence there. Fifthly, the Bible's amazing scientific accuracy and foresight. Of course, there are many critics that would say the Bible disagrees with science. They would point to verses that say things like, you know, uh, um, in Revelation 7, 1, it goes to the four corners of the earth. And we go, well, look, the earth doesn't have four corners. And yet even today we use that expression. You know, uh, CNN would go, we have reporters from the four corners of the earth. Why? What does that mean? It means they're going all over the world. It's not literal. And in that context, it's sort of, hey, the gospel has been taken to the four corners of the world. So they write from a point of view of them seeing it. Actually, if you think about it, we see the sun rise. But does the sun rise? No, the sun doesn't rise at all. But that's what we use because that's how we're viewing it. However... When it does talk about scientific facts, and some of these are really amazing when it comes to actually knowing about it. The Quran and other books like that actually are very unscientific. For example, the Hindu Vedas teach that the earth is flat and triangular. They also teach that earthquakes are the result of elephants shaking their bodies under the ground. The Quran in uh, book 1886 says that the sun sets in a muddy spring says, when he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a muddy spring. Whereas, in contrast, the the Bible is very, very different. Talking about the sun. In Psalm 19.6, David said, it is rising from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. For many years, Scotton went, you know what? The Bible is wrong. Claiming that it taught that the sun revolves around the earth. Scientists at that time said that the sun was stationary. However, it has now been discovered in recent years that the sun is, in fact, on a circuit through space. The shape of the earth. Job 26.10 says, God has inscribed a circle on the surface of waters and boundaries of light and darkness. There's so many actual facts that you get into. The suspension of the earth. Before Isaac Newton discovered gravity, Hindus believed that the earth rested on the back of an elephant who stood on the back of a turtle that was swimming the great endless sea. The Greeks believed that the mythical god Atlas carried the earth on his shoulders. What does the Bible say? In one of the oldest books, Job 26, 7, it says, God hangs the earth on nothing. He goes, it's hung on nothing. Nothing holds it up. That's one of the oldest books in the Bible, if not the oldest. Even the stars. For thousands of years, people have literally been naming and counting the stars. And people, you know, uh, Harappacus in... uh, 190 and 120 BC said there are exactly 1,026 stars. The German astronomer uh, Jonas uh, Kelper in 1571 to 1630 counted 1,006. It wasn't until Galileo, a devout Christian, pointed his telescope at the heavens in 1608. 
he discovered that all those counts were completely off. And in Jeremiah 32, uh, 33, 22, it says, the host of heavens cannot be numbered. We know that now. There are so many different things like that. Manuscript evidence. So, you know, can we trust, you know, isn't it a copy of 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 a copy? Some like to say that you can't trust it because it's a copy. Even if you go up to, most Muslims will go, which version of the Bible is true? You have so many different versions. No, we don't. What we have is an English language that is constantly changing or a foreign language that's changing. So we have to do revised versions because the language changes. So we have the King James Version over 400 years old that goes ye and thee and thou, which we don't use those words anymore. So we get the original scriptures again, translate them again to make it more understanding to us. That's why we have so many different types of Bibles. But there is so much manuscript evidence. So what is a manuscript? Well, a manuscript is basically a document that is written before we had the uh, printing press. Today, there survives more than 25,000 partial and complete ancient writings of the Bible, not just the New Testament. The most profound and the one that is uh, most relevant to us today, we had the privilege of actually going and seeing in Jerusalem. In 1947, a Muslim shepherd boy looking for his goat um, threw a stone into a cave around the Dead Sea and heard something break. So he investigated and he found what was, is now known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are actually complete copies of all the books in the Old Testament except for Esther. It was a community that had basically sealed up the caves as a library before the Romans maybe invaded and they have all these documents and they predate Jesus. So one of the things people have said is gone, well, we know how Jesus did all the prophecies. Because what happened was, is after he lived, people went and then rewrote the Old Testament to fit his life. But these are documents that predate Jesus' existence. So we know that the Old Testament has not been rewritten. And the complete book of Isaiah, which you can actually go and see and everything, um, they, they copied it word for word for what we have now, and it is exactly the same. They say that most probably Esther was not uh, um, there because Esther actually doesn't ever say the word God. And so this religious community, they may have gone, we're not going to trust that bit as that religious community because it actually doesn't have the word God in there. You know, there have been so many more. If you want a, a reference, F.S. Bruce's book, The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable, is a great recommendation. Evidence number seven. The Bible's forthright about its authors and its heroes' failures. Most people starting a religion or a new church or a new communist section of the world want to make out that their leaders were fantastic. Their leaders were perfect. You can say nothing wrong against their leaders. This is in stark contrast to the Bible. So actually, if you insult Muhammad, the prophet, Muslims will be very upset. And yet, we know that Noah got drunk, Abraham was a liar, Moses had an anger problem, Israel constantly re rejected God, David was adultery and killed his best mate, Jesus was called Satan by Peter, Peter was a scaredy cat, the disciples were always full of pride and arguing, even falling asleep at the really crucial moments in time. They ran away at the really crucial moment when they should have been there for Jesus. Paul says, I was a wretched man. And Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, two great leaders in the early movement, had a really big tiff at each other. It can go on and on and on. That's not the sort of thing that false religions do. False religions are trying to impress you. The truth of it is, humans are not impressive. The only one that is impressive is God. Eighth, the persecution the disciples endure. You know, you may be skeptical about this because you go, well... Many people die for causes. That's true. However, people don't normally die for a lie. So yes, Muslim terrorists die for Islam. Here's the difference. Muslim terrorists die for something they believe to be right. So they weren't there in Muhammad's time. They didn't see the angel Gabriel. They believe it's right. Whereas with the apostles, they were there. 
They knew if Jesus was God or not. They knew if he did the miracles. They knew if he rose from the dead or not. So they knew whether it was a truth or a lie. As opposed to us, we have faith that it was true. They were actually there. Most people do not die for a lie. The apostles, Matthew was slain by a sword in the city of Ethiopia. Mark died in Alexandria, North Egypt, after being cruelly dragged through the streets of that city. And all he had to do was like, it was a lie. Luke was hung upon an olive tree in the land of Greece. John was banished to the island of Patmos. James was beheaded. James the Lesser was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple. Philip was hung up against a pillar at Herodias, the province of uh, uh, Fergra. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Andrew was bound to a cross and left to die. Jude was, Jude was shot in the head with arrows. And Matthias, the apostle chosen to replace Jesus, was stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death uh, by the Jews of Salonica. Paul, after a variety of tortures and imprisonments, was finally beheaded in Rome. Thomas was run through uh, in, in, in the South India, and Peter was crucified upside down. So if you ask yourself, if you knew this was a made-up story, and all you had to do was to deny it, and you knew that there was no resurrection, would you really die for a lie that you knew was right, or knew that was wrong? No, you wouldn't. The other night, the Bible's transforming power for good. It is mind-blowing to me how the Bible changes people. It's one thing to get into a community and be influenced by your community to change. And that happens by human nature. So you can join a football team, and if they all wear yellow socks, you'll end up wearing yellow socks. That's social change. I'm talking about people where there are no churches. You're literally studying the Bible with someone under persecution, and they will read a scripture and it will change their life. They're just the same words as you find in the Lord of the Rings book or, or uh, some, you know, The Hobbit or something like that. But they're in a certain order and they're written by God. How is that possible? Why is that possible? It is because the word of God literally created the universe. And when he speaks it and they are his in his order, they literally change people's lives. In addition to changed lives, the Bible has inspired people. And these things come out of what is written in the Bible. Hospitals and orphanages are a Christian thing. The start of many universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, were started by Christians for Christian purposes. The launch of innumerable humanitarian efforts to the poor. Work of equality for men and women. Death to uh, um, uh, racism. I think about investigating the world and the universe scientifically, further development in things like arts and music, the abolish of slavery. William Wilberforce, an evangelical Christian, went, no, slavery needs to stop. You know, Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Mohammed, and Napoleon. Without science, without learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life that were never spoken before or since, and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of an orator or poet, without writing a single line. He set more pens in motion and furnished themes for more sermons, uh, speeches, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, and songs of praise than the whole army of great and ancient and modern times. And of all things he said, no one has ever dared say that to follow me, you must love your enemy. And lastly, the testimony of Jesus himself. Another reason you can be sure that all of the Bible is trustworthy is because Jesus says so. What do I mean? Well, sometimes we go, is Jonah and the whale true? Is Adam and Eve true? We know it's true because Jesus said it's true. I once met a Christian, I don't know, five years ago, says, I just think Jonah is a, like a, a parable. I go, well, then you don't believe what Jesus believes. You can't call yourself a Christian. Because Jesus said, it is absolutely truth. And John 7, 17, in his prayer, Jesus said, thy word is truth. Jesus historically confirms that Jonah and the well, the destruction of the world by a flood, and all other different things, Daniel, all of these stories actually happened. 
He definitively said, it is written, it is written, it is written. These things are true. You know, he taught that Adam and Eve actually happened. He said the Bible is infallible. John 10, 35 says the scriptures cannot be broken. He said it's indestructible. You think about how many religions or books do not exist today. And yet he says in Matthew 5, 18, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So many people have tried to destroy the Bible, its existence, and yet we are guaranteed that it will always be there. These are just some of the topics of why we can trust the Bible. It's building a case to go, you know what? Outside of the books, there is so much evidence to place your faith in the Bible. You know, in conclusion, can you trust the Bible? Yes, you can. You can read it with confidence and not read it at your peril. You can stand on its promises. When it says, blessed are the poor, he means you will be happier if you are poor. One of the most difficult scriptures for many to believe. You can draw comfort from its passages, gain wisdom from its pages, and at best, know that your creator loves you deeply. Do you know God in the Bible? If you're visiting here today, take time out. Understand the scriptures. It is not an old, irrelevant, unreliable book. It is a relevant book that can change your life. My challenge to you today is to study the Bible and allow just that for it to change your life. And amen. To hear more from Dr. Joe Willis, check out his two books on Amazon, The Art of Spiritual Warfare, Practicals for Becoming a Prayer Warrior, and Money is the Answer for Everything. Click the links in the description below. Also, for more life-changing lessons, subscribe to his YouTube channel, Dr. Joe Willis.